Okay, hello everybody, we're live, and before we start, I'm in Swellendam, I have no Ethernet connection, so if the stream drops or if things go horribly wrong, that's me, and unfortunately I do not have an Ethernet cable to fix that. So without further ado, we've got Paul Hart, grumpy old farmer, and then we've got Weekend Warrior Rowan, and we're going to be talking uh, farm attacks tonight so and obviously you guys are in the stream in the comments you will be giving us your two cents as well uh paul rowan nancy let's just act as if we haven't spoken to each other before tonight uh how are you guys doing hi nice to meet you like we, we talk quite a bit but nice to see you again <laughs> evening guys thank you like like okay so um this kind of segue as well doesn't segue off it it channels away or channels off our previous video well the, the video i did about preparing not so much preparing for a farm attack but in the sort of immediate security concern part of it and paul wanted to flesh that out a bit because paul you're a farmer we don't need to exactly know where you farm with what you farm but this is what you do professionally and you are far more acquainted with the daily dynamics and what you know the challenges are and what the realities are on the ground or in the felt for that matter um you can sort of kick it off from there and 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 we'll just bounce off what you say how's that awesome um i think we need to differentiate sort of right from the start between a farm attack and rural crime um because they do have very different components and although the two have become confused because of the uh, often the brutality involved in, in both type of attacks um that they do have different dynamics um your rural crime is is opportunistic just like crime in the city is where you have a couple of guys looking around walking around and they see something they want and they give it a go to take it um the farm attacks or the concepts of farm attacks were actually born in the early 80s when MK was given the go-ahead to, to target Boers to chase them from the land. Um, and, and it was a strategy that, that sort of encouraged a lot of brutality um, because uh, the farmers are actually sort of tough buggers and wouldn't just run away quickly. And it, it was a successful strategy if, if you sort of read between the lines because between 1994 and now we've lost 50% of our commercial farmers. They have, they have stopped farming. They've been, they have been chased off the land. Um, farm attacks very often, more often than not, and it's about a third of the incidents that occur on farms don't involve theft. If anything is taken, it's generally handguns out of safe, the bolt action hunting rifles are left. They, they serve no purpose to, to the perpetrators. And they are generally, a genuine farm attack is extremely well executed. Um, there are a lot of, there's a lot of sort of security camera footage, etc., available. And you can see by the way the guys move, the way they deploy, the way they approach their targets, that, that they do know what they're doing. Now, any farmer can and should be able to defend against rural crime. Um, and it, it grates me when I read about the farmers who, who had the gun in the safe yep. and were sitting on the ship of an aunt. Um, quite frankly, it's their own fault. Um, so defending against rural crime, sure, no problem. Defending against the genuine farm attack is a completely different scenario um, because there you're facing sort of multiple attackers who are not incompetent with their weapons. Uh, they have a plan, they have a strategy, they know what they're doing. And there, one farmer with, with a pump action shotgun or a nine mole, the odds are against him. Um, yep. he's, he's, he's not in the best position. And that's where sort of the mindset thing, which, which we talk about a lot, comes into it. Um, and it's there, it has to be not just the mindset of the head of the house, the farmer. Um, it has to be the mindset of the entire family. Yeah. Um, because if your 80-year-old old Omar lives in the house with you, 
and you've got a 10 year old daughter plus your wife, everybody's got to be in on the plan. And, and you've got two options. You either comply and hope for the best um, or you fight back. But if you decide, if the entire family unit decides you're going to take the fight back option, then everybody has to fight back. Your 80 year old Oma or your 10 year old daughter has got to be willing cap and capable to take the nine mil out of your bloody corpse's hand and carry on the fight. And, and that's where I think sort of Brian's article initially it sort of grated me reading that. It was kind of because it was, you know, as, as a farmer, it was kind of, oh, bollocks, you know, we, we do everything we can. And then I read it about four or five more times and I got the points and I agree with it entirely. But there is a different dynamic when it's a genuine farm attack. Um, I mean, farmers are their own worst enemies. They they um, they become complacent. Um, and as a farmer, I have possibly for the last 15 years sort of hovered between condition orange and red permanently, sort of just bordering in the red. Um, because farm attacks start long before the actual event. Um, farmers and farms are scoped. And the guy that turns up on your farm who's just dressed a bit odd with a fancy car or not it's not so fancy car wanting to buy sheep but you grow tomatoes that's the actual start of your farm attack or the two guys waiting at your gate you ask them what they want there and they're looking for somebody you've never heard of what they want to job but you're in the middle of nowhere they, they're checking you out and and Farmers, unfortunately, are very friendly people, um, very welcoming, very hospitable. Um, and, and therein comes the rub, because your initial reaction to any stranger on a farm environment sort of predetermines how you evaluate it as a target. Yeah. Um, mm. So I, I spend my life doing a bloody miserable old bastard to anybody I see walking on my neighbor's land who walks into my farm wanting a job or to buy apples from me because I don't grow apples. And and that's, you know, your initial impression is so important to almost prevent a farm attack. And that also relates to how, how your staff perceive you because your staff, like it or not, are a huge source of information, um, either willingly or unwillingly. Um, a couple of drinks in the tavern and um, they'll tell anybody anything about um, who they work for. But you so know, that's, that, that's my sort of, yeah. yeah. But I, I wanted to agree with exactly what you said. I mean, I, I for my sins, I, I spent a few years in the security industry and there's this, aside from the obvious that it can't happen to me, which is probably the single biggest mistake you can make, there's this thing where, where people, they don't realize the way where Gideon's job is a pilot, yours is a farmer. I work in, in my new job, I work in marketing. That's our day jobs. These guys, their day job is crime. This is what they do. Um, they, their hours might be different than ours, but it's a professional occupation yeah. for the lack of a better way to describe it. They don't do this willy-nilly. We're not talking about a guy that grabs a, a handbag from a lady, you know, outside the spa. These are professionals at what they do. And the quicker people start realizing that you're not going up against some, excuse the pun, weekend warrior, it, the better. Um, these are terrorists, for the lack of a better word. That's This is what they do. And the people need to start realizing that. And, and, and until they start doing that, I mean, it's a lost cause. Yeah, and there's. Well, I've got some questions on the on the side. For example, how do they? Where did the guy get the uh, cell phone jammers from? I can get a hold of a cell phone jammer. I can get quite easily just by asking the right people. I can get my hands on a serious cell phone jammer. And the thing with cell phone jammers are, you could get away with using small ones, 
because it'll disrupt the signal in a very small area. The bigger your cell phone jammer, the bigger area you disrupt, you start accidentally taking entire towers off the grid. The cell phone companies monitor for that kind of stuff. They'll pick it up and they'll come after you. But um, it's not getting this type of equipment. Um, cell phone jammers, easy, easy to get. Uh, military grade rifles, very easy to get. You either get them from a mate in the cops who either uh, lends it to you or, you know, it's stolen. There's so many police firearms circulating. I don't think it, there's there's that many struggle caches left, but there's still a, a huge amount of arms flow over the border, especially from Mozambique and Zim. Uh, getting the equipment, if you if you are a, a serious criminal, whether it's a CIT heist guy or a farm attacker, getting the equipment isn't difficult. A lot of these guys, and if you see like this this hostage situation in the in the church in Gauteng, uh, Joburg side, there were actual military metro and and police members involved in on the on the wrong side of that whole debacle. Lots of military trained, actual serving members of the cops and the military perpetrate crime to this extent. So if we're talking about military trained, a lot of the guys might actually be in the military. Um, it's not even a case of ex-military. It might be current serving. So that's part of your problem. Yeah. Um, you know, one, one thing that we do do sort of out in the, in the rural areas is watch our cell phone signal. Um, if your cell phone signal's gone, there is a problem. The other problem we have is is that um, ESCOM and the load shedding. The cell phone towers generally don't have batteries anymore because they've all been stolen. Yeah. Um, so when ESCOM goes down, the cell towers don't go down. And then you don't know what, you know, whether it's jamming or whether it's the tower because the load shedding. Um, so, so that's why I say, if, if you want to be a farmer, if you want to live on a farm, you can't walk around um, in condition green. You, you've got to be expecting the worst all the time. And it's possibly a shitty way to live, but it's the reality. If you want to live, that's how you have to live. Yeah. The consequences are, are far worse um, of not having that, that uh, alert level. We know what happens if you submit and you say, cool, don't hurt me, do what you want. Um, I don't think, you know, we need to unpack the consequences because uh, as there's, so, there's been so many examples of it. Yeah, look, of, often the, the, the sort of option to comply or fight is taken out of your hands. I, I personally know somebody, and here we get to the whole dog thing, um, because I've seen a lot of comments on, on your Facebook posts about, you know, get a hundred bull bulls or a Rottweiler or this or that. I personally so know somebody who, who didn't have, have the option of fight or comply because him and his wife woke up in their bedroom with six guys around them with pungas. Um, they, they, you have no option. There, there's no fight anymore. You, you, you've lost the fight already. Um, the thing about dogs is they had seven dogs sleeping in their bedroom with him. Um, and these are the kind of dogs when you go and visit, even if you've visited a hundred times, you stay in your car until they come and fetch the dogs. These seven dogs, four were Irish wolfhounds, there were two Rottweilers and then a couple of yappers, did absolutely nothing. And it's, it's the whole two-step thing. Um, any dog, regardless of how tra well trained, um, with a little bit of effort, is no longer well trained. These dogs were so terrified of the attackers that they had to actually lift a cupboard up to get the one Rottweiler out from under the cupboard where it had wedged itself in terror. Um, so dogs are fantastic warning devices. Um, but what a lot of people do is your dog yaps. You tell it to shut up. Yeah. Um, it yaps again the next night. You tell it to shut up because you're watching Seven Delon. And then you habituate your dog not to bark anymore, and then it's no longer a warning system. Um, our dogs, if they twitch your ear and look towards the door, we're up, we're ready. Um, and then normally, because my one dog has a fetish about birds, it's a bird that's sitting on the roof or in a tree. Um, but you've got to take it seriously. Um, they're a wonderful warning system, but no dog, regardless of how well attack-trained 
you think it is, is going to save your house. But, you know, Paul makes an interesting point. I spoke to somebody that was at a kind of some kind of a canine unit um, and he explained something very interesting about dogs to me. And he said that a dog, to be effective as a, as a proper guard dog slash attack dog in whatever you want to call it, it is a, it's almost a specialized field in, in that environment. Um, yes, a dog will bite to a certain degree out of instinct, but to be aggressive, um, like truly aggressive, is, is, a, is, is to a large degree trained. And also that environment where the dog is, is working and biting and doing that kind of stuff, it's very tiring for the dog. And if the dog is not conditioned to do that, like a you know a proper working dog that the guys use in the Kruger and whatnot, it's not something. It, it, it's it's gonna maybe bite once or twice if it bites, and then it's it it's kind of yeah oh, no, okay I'm done with this. Um, it's not a, 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 a something that you can rely on unless it's been really and truly trained into that dog. You, you do what you want it to do. Just to rely on it to do it magically, it's just, it doesn't work like that. No, the, the amount of time and effort you have to put into, I mean, I've I've got friends that they did a whole uh, thing where they were training German Shepherds and Belgian Malinois specifically for, well, it, it's a German sport in South Africa called Schutzhund and stuff like that. So it's basically man work with this dog where they, you know, attack the guy wearing the, the padded suit. Um, the amount of time and effort and hours and money you have to spend to get a a dog, even with a high prey drive, halfway decently trained into a decent guard dog slash attack dog slash whatever, is humongous. Ultimately, it's going to make more sense financially and otherwise to just layer your security otherwise with physical barriers, be it alarms, infrared cameras, um, all this sort of stuff, because ultimately all those things are defeatable, but their purpose is to buy you time to firstly get help on the way and secondly prepare your defense. Um, or should I rather put it the other way around? Firstly, prepare your defense and secondly, get the help coming while, you know, while you've done that. That's the only point of it. It's also there to make sure that at 3 a.m., if something is spooking uh, your sheep or some other thing is going on outside, you don't need to leave the house to see what's going on ultimately if something's spooking your animals and your power's off and you and you can't use your cameras those are three major indicators that you should not fucking go outside right now <laughs> because um there's a reason why all three of these things have just happened you know, and, and um, no sorry go, go ahead Paul. no um you know Yes and no. If, if, if you're on a farm, I can get you out your house pretty easily. Um, if, if you're not going to come out to check why there's no water and the boil's not working or what's happened to your power, I'm just going to set your house on fire. Yeah. You've got to come out. Um, I just want to mention something about fences. Um, any fence is breachable. Um, absolutely any fence, especially if you're sitting out in the dark and you've got three, four hours um, to get through a fence. Electric fences are probably the easiest thing to breach. Um, personally, um, the kind of fences I like and the kind of fences I have are the, the kind of fence that's going to make you think, hell, if this guy's chasing me because things have gone pear-shaped for me as the bad guy and I can't find the hole I cut in the fence to get out, I'm pretty stuffed. So I like razor wire, um, full blanket fence razor wire. Because if you can't find the hole you came in, in you're not getting out in a hurry. That's a very good point. Now, I've, I've seen guys breach a normal residential palisade fence in seven seconds. Through, not over, through. You know, and, and it's stupid tools that they use to, to get through this stuff. And but you know, Hidon, we I think it was on, on this this past week we we got quite a bit of flack on, on Paratus. Um, we always get flack on Paratus. You have to be more specific. <laughs> you need to be more specific. Um, it was about the farmers, and, and we got 
kind of for all practical purposes verbally, at- <laughs> verbally attacked uh, um, about the costs. And, you know, having come from that industry, I've got a better clue than most what things like CCTV, infrared beams, et cetera, et cetera, costs. And I, I and look, they're great. And with the, with the latest technology you can get in terms of CCTV, you can catch those guys a kilometer away from your house for a joke. I mean, easy. But there's, as like with most things, there's a cost involved in it. And just this past Saturday, I was sitting and speaking to to a local farm. He's a farmer from Ermelo, but he lives in George now. I still got farms up there. But they're in the, the different camp, in the kind of we're prepared and we know, you know, things might happen to us. And and he concurs with me on this, that you do not need to spend 100, 200, 300,000 rand to protect the farmhouse. It's not necessary. I mean, how much does it really cost you to just bo- corner off, oh, sorry, um, uh, barricade off the bedrooms? You're really telling me there's not enough scrap steel on a farm to weld a gate in the hallway. It's, it's, it's not a lot, but it's still better than nothing. It costs nothing. nothing. Exactly. It costs nothing to lock a door. Nothing. Zero cost. It costs nothing to carry your gun. I mean, just being aware is half the fight won. Once again, zero cost. But there's this, it's, I, I sometimes get the sense that there's, and I'm generalizing, and, and, and I suppose if you're taking this personally, I'm probably talking about you, but there's this, this sense that it's always somebody else's problem. You know, the, the government needs to fix it. No, we must have a commando. No, we must have a farm watch. Was with Sam Stan, and I'm like, dude, locking well, the farm watch is now. a good idea, but no, still, we'll enough. get to that. We'll get to that. That, that, that. That's not the point. But locking your door now might save your life now. Carrying your gun might save your life now. And and, and just sometimes I get the sense that, and once again, generalizing that people are looking for. A real complicated, expensive solution to some, to some things that might be solved with a simple solution. Um, and, and I just think they're overlooking some really obvious things sometimes. Yeah, most, most definitely. Um, I think there's a kind of a ratio of 50% of, of farmers who take it really seriously. Um, I'm probably in the sort of completely paranoid camp. Um, when I go and shower, I, I have a firearm in the shower with me. You're um, not paranoid if they're out to get you, so. It's, 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 it's always within our reach. Um, and the other 50%, if you look at the age profile of people who are getting attacked, um, probably should have firearms, but I, I think many of them probably shouldn't. You know, 80-year-old farmers, 70-year-old farmers, 65-year-old farmers. Um, the and, and those are the victims of rural crime as opposed to farm attacks. Um, and, and I think they're, they're selected because of their age profile. And they almost, they've been living the way they have for the last, 50, 60 years, and they, they're not prepared to change. They're not interested in changing. That's unfortunately also a reality that I've seen in, in our own farming district in the in the free state is the, the younger guys, and I'm saying younger as in the guys under 60, um, are usually fully like buying in to the whole personal and property safety angle, whereas the guys over 70 are tending to be a bit more blase about it if not completely and obviously 60 to 70 there's like the marmite effect gap in the middle where (laughs) half the people are paranoid well healthily so and the other half couldn't give a fuck and that's part of the problem now just to quickly circle back about getting the people out their house the cool thing about setting someone's house on fire is that if you're inside that house you're under absolutely no illusions 
about the, the, the depth of the fuck up you now find yourself in. Um, not that that necessarily is a good thing because some people might freeze and have no idea how to handle it and other people be like, okay, we need to get out and they're waiting for us outside. And this is where you hope, okay, firstly, you've got either a satellite phone or a radio connection to call for help. Secondly, that you've got body armor of some sort. Uh, you've got a firearm that you're competent with and the rest of the people in the house with you know what to do because they're part of your plan. They're part of the same mindset and that you've got more than one escape route you can you can pick and you've, you've got a vague idea of what to do. And this kind of ties in with preparing for your own defense and preparing for that is a worst case. I can't think of a worse situation to be, and as Fortis says, how many houses have been set on fire? Uh, none, but probably because ultimately that that no one's ever had to have set a house on fire because that wasn't well, necessary. There was actually there was actually an incident this week where the farmer's house was set on fire. Okay, so uh, we've had one. Yeah, and and I, I can't sort of recall specifics, but there have been a couple of incidents like that. Um, either the house or the felt. You know, you you, you have a, a felt fire on your farm. Um, you can't wait for every, anybody. You have to go out and you've got to get that fire out before it spreads. Um, yep. You don't have much of a choice. Yep. Uh, and you're probably going to end up in a firefight before you get to fight the fire. No, no pun intended, because that's the reason your house is burning. Um, yeah. Or something similar. But the fun, you know, it was... <laughs> With well, a yeah, firefight, last here, week, yeah. <laughs> go run. I'll have so, last, last week, I, um, I, you know, and I'm just going to touch on it because I think it's it, it, it's relevant. You know, I last week I got cornered by uh, a local pastor here in George, uh, Dwemny, Dwemny, yeah, here in George, and um, and he's kind of in the kind of considering getting a firearm, and he was having a chat with me about it, and I said to him. Just the bare fact that me and you are having a discussion about this. So, so he's a mountain biker, right? And there's been some incidents in our neck of the woods, some one or two like pretty nasty ones. And I said to him, just the bare fact that you are having this discussion with me tells me you are number one realizing that there might be a problem. And should you be accosted in the forest by some gentleman? Your default setting will not be, oh, look, here's some hikers. It will be one of, hold on, hold on there's trouble here. Yeah. And but, but my point that I wanted to get to was you should be on that same though. Now your house is being set on fire. Your cell phone is not working. Your pump is all of a sudden randomly being switched off. What, whatever kind of anomaly you know, there is on the farm. Your default shotting setting should be one of hold on, there's there's a problem, and they Gideon, you need to help me with the name of, of of the author quickly. The book's name is Left of Bang. Um, uh, we we talked about this last week. I can't remember the author's name, but if you Google Left of Bang, that is going to be the book you're going to find, and it's about. One of the it's oh, this is crucial reading. No, 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 I'm just taking over. I'm just going to say it's crucial reading. Because if you, whether you are living in a city as a Stotsiopi or regardless of where you move, whether you're a farmer, it doesn't matter. Your life has a baseline normal setting. Yeah. You know what a normal day is like. And you also know what normal variations away from the norm look like. When something happens that is like far away from that baseline, that's usually... Yeah a major indicator that stuff's about to go wrong. And as you said, um, Paul, farm attacks start long before, you know, they kick your door down. This mm. is not, this is not something that just happens on the day either. Not usually. And uh, here, it, here it comes the problem sort of as a farmer, if, if I'm subjected to a genuine farm attack, um, Let's take a bare minimum because farm attacks are generally between four up to 20 people. But let's say, for argument's sake, there are five people and three of them have handguns and two of them have automatic weapons. I'm immediately outgunned. Um, I'm, I'm, 
I'm hamstrung by the government and, and the gun laws in this country where I effectively can't own weaponry that allows me to, to be on an equal playing field. Um, so we are stuck with our bolt actions and our pump actions and our nine moles. Um, and it's not a fair fight against two guys wielding AKs and three guys wielding nine moles. And it's a misconception that these guys can't shoot. Um, they can shoot, it's their job. Um, it's what they do for a living. They, they're probably far better at it than most people. Um, so, you know, we, yes, I mean, it's, it's, it's fighting against thunder, but we need to access to better weapons. Um, I've been declined for semi-automatic three times, SLR. Um, they just won't give me an AR-15. And it, it's a ridiculous scenario where the criminals are better armed than the victims. And Anton asked an interesting question on the stream about getting your family involved in, in scenarios. Most definitely. And your family, whoever lives with you, have to be able to use every weapon that you own. Um, whether it's the 357 Magnum or the pump action shotgun or the 9 mil, everybody in your house needs to be able to shoot all your guns because there's no guarantee that you as, as the sort of primary responder are going to be in the fight for long um, or you're going to make it to the end of the fight and, and everybody that you live with needs to keep on fighting. Yeah. Um, by the way, uh, Paul, uh, offline, please um, let me know why they refused you your AR-15 and, you know, we can always take a look at, at, at maybe fixing that problem for you. Um, there are ways and means. Yeah, it, it it could be it could be something stupidly simple, or it could be something as insidious as an incompetent station commander who just refuses to recommend it or something bizarre. But we'll um, we'll take it from there. Um, and sorry, the author was Jason Riley and Patrick Van Horn of Left of Bank. That's you guys can find it. Uh, Brett asked about the consequences of lethal force if you are under an unlawful attack by somebody and you perceive that attack to be life-threatening or somebody else who's innocent, you perceive the attack to be life-threatening, you can use lethal force to stop that attack. That means if you have to shoot the guy 20 times to stop the attack, then you got to shoot him 20 times to stop the attack. It becomes an issue. What people do that get them into trouble um, uncommonly is where the guy's already down and out and then they keep shooting him, but that's not always such a major issue because the fight response isn't like a switch that you can just switch off once it's engaged. So if someone's going to be stupid enough to start a gunfight, chances are they're going to end up dead and the court isn't going to give you too much of a hassle. A lot of issues come in when people start tampering with the scene or lying to the police and then they get nailed for obstruction of justice because they think that they're going to go to jail for murder. So they panic. So they do stupid shit as opposed to just being normal. That that has gotten far more people into trouble than legitimate self-defense shootings have. Um, that's just in my, you know, from what I've seen and heard. But you know, that's, a, that's, a, it's like, that's an important point. I mean, probably just last week, I had two conversations with, with people that want to become gun owners. You were actually phoning me on the middle of the middle of the one conversation and I said I'll phone you back. And that question that you address now, can I shoot? What will happen to me? Will I pass go and go straight to jail? Yes, it's probably one of the single biggest myths or untruths, false, what, I don't want to what, know what to call it, that we are dealing with. And and it grates my carrot that it's being, to a large degree, punted by a bunch of uneducated on the subject idiots around Bryflash fires that keep saying that this nonsense and then not, instead of persuading their friends and family members to get guns, they um, um, help me with the word. They they 
uh, uh, discourage them of, sorry, yes, I'm Afrikaans, sorry. Yeah? Um, they discourage them of getting firearms. And it, and I think if, if that's one thing that can be solved, it will, it will make such a massive difference in the amount of legal firearms owners in this country. If, if people can just realize it is not game set and match, you will immediately go to jail if you shoot somebody. No. No. Look, we know that there's incompetence. A of, sorry, sorry, yeah, Karen. Um, a lot of policemen have that opinion as well. Um, that, oh, if you shoot somebody, I'll have to arrest you for murder. Um, and the policeman is not the judge and jury, but um, you, you, you've got to be prepared. If you shoot somebody, you, you, you're more than likely, especially in a rural setting where the boor is the enemy, um, you are going to spend at least a night in the sun. But that's better than being dead. Absolutely. Ultimately, that's not the, the end of the world. The end of the world is if you get murdered in front of your children if your wife wife or your daughter or get, get raped by these guys, there's a whole bunch of shit that's far worse than taking out five or six scumbags and spending a night in a jail cell and getting um, getting bail the next day. And I've seen so many cases of really good criminal defense attorneys taking cases on pro bono if people can't afford defense. Uh, it happened to a, uh, a guy in Chabo uh, last year, I think Jan or Feb, and it happened to a few other cases I've seen. So ultimately, there, there will be legal assistance. The thing is just to don't do stupid shit after you've sh done the shooting. <laughs> that is, that if I could give people advice, if you survive the attack, if you win, if you nail the bastards, don't do stupid shit afterwards. Okay, that's it. Like, don't panic, stay calm, and just make sure you've plugged all the bleedy bits in you because you might be bleeding. And worry about the rest later. Yeah, and if if you are a farmer and you live on a farm, um, stop sticking your head in the sand. Um, actually, read about farm attacks and read about what is being done to the victims. Um, I, I think a lot of farmers are caught unawares and have sort of a lackadaisical attitude because they they choose to ignore what's going on out there mm -hmm. and what's going on out there is horrific people being tortured for hours with boiling water children being raped in front of their parents um if you're a farmer you need to be aware of this stuff you need to be aware this could potentially be your family and and you need to live accordingly that's exactly it go road sorry <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but I, I wanted to I wanted to to agree with Paul, you know, where there's this, and once again, sharing everybody over the same code, and if you take it personally, it probably relates to you. But it it's you're just I winning me so many fans tonight. Sorry, Ro. <laughs> just, but you know what? I'm 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 wording what a lot of us talk about offline. Yeah, you know, and exactly. what a lot of the top trainers in the country talk about offline. Um, and if I'm a little bit unpopular because I say, oh, well, you know, I've got friends and I am married, so I don't need to impress anybody. But um, it's there's this, to a very large degree, a lackadaisy, uh, yeah, that's such a nice word, a lackadaisy approach to this. And, and I think to a large degree in the, in the, in the kind of, traditionally safer safer provinces, if I can call it like that. I mean, I think if you talk to a lot of the farmers in Limpopo and, and the Lowfeld, you know, you'll have a bit of a different attitude there than a guy that farms in, you know, somewhere in the Western Cape. I mean, I've had the experience a while ago um, where I went to a meeting at a, at a local farmers' union and um, association, I can't remember, I'm not, I'm not going to disclose the name, but, and we were just having a chat and whatnot, and safety was a 10-minute segment in the whole meeting, um, and with all the respect in the world, the, they were more interested in the free cook sisters than, you know, actually discussing the problems that they might be facing and 
the local FATS representative, and you know, I'm allowed to say it because I'm not exactly built for high speed activities myself, but this oak couldn't even get over, over a farm gate himself, you know. So, and now he's advising these people on, 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 on farm safety. And then I think to myself, I mean, what, why does something bad need to happen before you realize there's actually a problem? Why does it have to be, be a problem first? I mean, Gidon, we and you've discussed it in, in some of our previous articles. I mean, we've got all this information at our fingertips, masses and masses and masses of information and, in, and data and, and forget the real world training, subject matter experts available at your fingertips. But we still refuse to listen and we still like to, like Paul said, stick our heads in the sand and, and think that it can't happen to us. And, and until that gets solved, and I've said it earlier, it's just simply not going to make a difference. It's a paradigm shift. Um, yeah, yeah. And the age profile of um, lots of farmers, including myself, um, I was most in the army. You can't teach me anything. Um, oh, my goodness. The reality is, is, is that 80% um, of the I was most in the army were, were um, tampon tiffies or, or chefs. Um, so yeah, and that and that was like forty years ago. So that that's not going to help much because you didn't have sort of the weaponry that you have available nowadays. Um, I would just on on the training thing say that um, training has to be realistic. Um, I've seen so many training videos with guys running around in full combat gear um, and knee pads and tactical boots and tactical cap and tactical sunglasses, doing all kinds of weird shit that looks really cool. But if you're Paul, attacked keep quiet. in your Paul, keep going, keep going, Paul, keep going. If, if you're attacked in your farmhouse, you're either in your jammies and barefoot, or you're in your jocks, or if you sleep car cut, that's how you are, and that's how you're exactly. fighting. You're not fighting with knee pads and elbow pads so that you can crawl around. Train in your pajamas. If that's if that's the scenario you're training for, that's how you should train. You don't have your your very cool tactical belt on with um, your your multiple magazine pouches. You probably just had time to grab the gun off off the bedside table, and that's what you've got to fight with, and that's how you're fighting, and that's how you need to train. Um, I see so many people going to train at the range. I won't mention what range I go to, but um, they'll stand five meters from a target and they'll plonk 20 rounds and sort of get a reasonably good grouping and they'll strut off ready ready for Armageddon. They, they've now trained. Um, my poor son um, has, has had a terrible life on the range because he doesn't get to shoot for bull's eyes and, and, and sort of, you know, have a 20 second pause between every shot he fires. Um, his old man stands behind him, smacking him on the head and kicking him in the ass and then telling him to shoot. Um, <laughs> and capacity matters if you're on a farm. I've got back problems because I carry like five mags on my belt plus, plus a firearm. Um, but yeah, if you're in a fight, um, you're never going to complain about having too much ammo. Paul, you speak our language here. I think you have just summarized a huge, huge, huge bugbear complaint, pain in the ass that so many of us have with training is everyone wants tactical shit. They want stuff that makes them feel like a SWAT team operator from the LAPD in the 1990s. It's all the feel-good chemicals you get off in your brain by doing this high-speed, low-drag stuff that is applicable maybe if you are that kind of operator in a team, none of that's going to help you if you're alone with maybe like your 10 year old daughter in a house that's being attacked by 20 armed guys. Uh, it's, <laughs> you need to learn the opposite to that, but that's not sexy. No one wants to spend money on that. I mean, if you look at, at, at some of the workshops, I mean, he me and you have done, I think a, a fair number of, 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 of workshops and training and, you know, and there's nothing like being cursed at in Afrikaans by Arne Barlow to, no. to make you realize you don't shoot as well as you think you do. Um, well, that's after he blixums you in his garage, which is, I think, the only reason he invites me to train with him is because he likes it. 
the Sabres. Exactly. And that's how, many, <laughs> how many of them will say, yeah, but we do a basics, we do a fundamental scores, and there's just no interest. No. But advertise a vehicle or whatever else scores, you're unindicted by um, by calls. I mean, and I can I can speak from experience. I mean, we we've hosted him a number of times. Um, when I did firearms fundamentals with him the first time a number of years ago, I struggled to fill the class locally. Uh, it was really a it was a mission to get enough guys to fill the workshop. Um, a year or so ago, we did vehicle combatives with him. Oh, sleek and cool and jumping over hoods. I had to fight guys off to, to that, that wanted to book on the course. And dude, you can't come on the course if you haven't done the basics. And, and it's exactly, it's just, not, it, you'll struggle to find guys to do the important stuff, but they all want to do, you know, the, the sexy training, rush around on Bucky, shooting off the back. And like, no, it's nonsense. The high speed, low drag stuff that that of questionable value, but you can't even do a normal malfunction clearing. And shooting fundamentals are more important than high speed, low drag because if you can shoot straight and you can clear malfunctions, you just know what you're doing under a bit of stress. You're probably going to do better than rolling around in the dirt in your pajamas without your knee guards, uh, trying to remember what the Israeli special forces do taught you last weekend. <laughs> Uh. Um, yeah, maybe I should make myself a little bit unpopular, seeing that Kudiyam's become so unpopular lately. Um, farm watchers, um, they're good ones, and they're not so good ones. And, and yeah. my, my sort of the verdicts out for me on, on farm watchers about whether I would want a whole lot of guys with guns who I don't know that well. Um, and I don't, more importantly, know their skill level with those guns rushing to come and save me. Um, they might be the ones that shoot me. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. And, That's a very valid concern, and, and, actually. And just like neighborhood watches where you get every Rambo with his tactical gear um, strutting around in the streets with his flashy strobe lights, um, you know, unless these guys are... Are proficient in what they do, um, they could cause more harm than good. Um, I, I've heard sort of lots of complaints from policemen I know at sort of after the event of the scene that the scene's been completely trampled. Um, there's no evidence left to gather because the farm was rushed in. Um, but there have been incidents in our area where the farm watch have saved people's asses. It just depends which farm you what you you choose to align to, and yeah, if 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 you're going to be part of a farm watch, be part of one where you know how proficient people are with weapons. But you, 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 like you, you make such you a good point. I mean, no, no I'm just yeah, I'm just agreeing no with good, you. I mean, yeah. it's no good surviving an attack and then getting shot in the face by your neighbour. Um, no. It's there not going to help you at all. I'm, I'm not going to say the organization, but yes, I saw a course <laughs> advertised last year, and it was literally advertised as hostage rescue. That was the wording used in the course. I remember Two that. days, 150 rounds. And I'm thinking to myself, it, 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 how it takes professionals months and months and thousands and thousands and thousands of rounds to get that highly specialized part of training under the belt. And even then, it's super high risk. And these guys are running around teaching hostage rescue over two days with 150 rounds. And on that course, they are children. Kids, school kids. And I'm thinking to myself, dude, apply some critical thinking. F forget about my opinion. It's irrelevant. Apply critical thinking. You really think it's a good idea for a 15-year-old and his 18-year-old brother to do to come and save you. It's 
I mean, in what world does that make any sense? But those workshops are full. Well, because it's sexy, Ron. By the, by the way, Lucinda wants your number. <laughs> He's married. Um, no, but she wants to get in, in comms uh, or in touch with you regarding uh, Southern Cape training. So if you wouldn't mind maybe just um, putting it in the comments and I can blow it up. Um, and we'll take it from there. Sure. And Mr. Mr. Satole, Brian's joining us. Other Brian. Um, as the main cause of farm attacks been discussed, he asks, well, we kind of touched, it wasn't so much a cause as it was a conduct, Paul, I think, with regards to how coordinated, well-equipped and well-trained and the difference between that and yeah. rural crime. Yeah, look, rural crime's opportunistic. It, it's to go and steal shit um, that somebody else has got um, by killed or, or low-skilled people. Farm attack is highly proficient, trained people, um, concept was born in the 80s when NK was going, given the go-ahead to chase the farmers off the land, and it's been a very successful testing. Whether that sort of order was ever withdrawn is up for debate, but it continues to this day. And look, our, our political rhetoric in this country has made farmers or boers, anybody who's on a farm is a boer, um as almost these inhumane thieves um who don't deserve any mercy uh, and who are public enemy number one i mean that's the reality um we have presidents ex-presidents sort of high profile political leaders singing about killing us um when they take into task on it they oh no no well it's just you know it's 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 not literal. It's just like you know, euphemistic, a, a traditional kind of thing. But um, that's the reality. People people are presidents are saying um, shoot the boy, um, and it continues to this day. If if I ran around sort of singing songs and and waving banners around about shooting lesbians in wheelchair, I'd probably be like in jail in a matter of minutes um but it's okay to 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 sing about shooting farmers it it it's it's accepted and and then we're shocked and horrified when it happens and there's protest marches and i i, I got kicked off a uh save the farmers group the other day because i politely said that um you're wearing a white ribbon doesn't actually help me as a farmer please don't waste your time um, but it doesn't because it's become acceptable. We sing about kidney farmers. This is our reality. And again, Paul, as you touched on, the wearing the ribbon doesn't help. And we wanted to talk about farm watches, and he made a very good point that, that kind of slipped me by is the fact that the guy who might be coming to help you might be the guy who ends up shooting you and to illustrate why that's not a stupid thing to worry about highly professional highly trained special forces units get friendly fire incidents all the time all the time if shit's going down and there's confusion and you don't know who who's coming towards you but you know that there's a lot of danger around and you misidentify the situation or the person and you shoot them that can happen stuff like that happens far too regularly which again emphasizes that if you are on a farm watch as much as on a neighborhood watch and if you're armed you need to train together you need to spend time and money and resources in maintaining a level of proficiency and coordinate and not just with your guns it's also with coordinating a response communicating effectively things that a lot of people take for granted that aren't aren't natural things you don't people don't just know instinctively some people do know instinctively how to communicate effectively most people don't they either gain effective communication skills through experience or through being taught and trained how to have them and this is all part again of the thing it's a much bigger solving rural violence because that's not what i'm lumping rural crime and farm attacks under as as the big thing of violence there is some overlap but you need a response element you need a community response element, which which means people need to buy into the idea. 
You make a. Um, just this morning, I was watching a, a video by 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 Pat McNamara uh, from T Max Inc. And he said, "Experience is the thing you get exactly after you need it." And <laughs> there's this. We've had a discussion. I think it was one of the articles I did for you a number of years ago. You know, and I'm not taking anything away from farm watches, neighborhood watches, commandos. No, there's a time and a place for that. But, and exactly as the same with the ribbons um, Paul just mentioned, there's this fallacy of, of delegated responsibility where I will not do anything because there's a farm watch. Um, or I've, I'm it's the wearing, free rider problem. Exactly. I'm wearing yeah. a ribbon, so I have not done something. Or I have posted on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, whatever your flavor is. So I have now done something. Um, and, and you see that so many times, 99% of the times, if farm tax are being discussed, some guy will say we need to bring back the commandos. Um, now, aside from the obvious fact that it's never going to happen, it, it delegates the responsibility to other people. And, and as... Dave Spalding says so beautifully, you need to be a participant in your own rescue. I mean, that's where it starts. It always starts close to you and it works its way out. Yeah. Um, a lot of this stuff is, is easy to say and easy to do because it means I don't have to do anything. Now, I'm not a farmer, so I can probably say whatever the hell I want and take it with a wheelbarrow of salt. But the same principles applies. You know, you're sitting in my little duplex in the George CBD, it still starts with me. You know, it's... it's um, yeah. I've, I've got this thing on my farm. I, I have a number of young, capable gentlemen, you know, the 20-somethings fit guys, um, and, and they understand and they've been given explicit instructions if the shit hits the fan on the, on the farm, they to hunker down and hide under their beds. Um, because I'm shooting anything that moves outside. And uh, that's why my first call will never be the farm watch, because then I don't know who I'm shooting at. I'm shooting at everybody. Um, I'm, not, I'm not asking who you are first and if you're on my side. Um, so, yeah, it, 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 and it's also the, the fight mentality. If, if you live on a farm, you have to have a fight mentality. Um, the, you sound like our Clint is, Smith. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the problem with, it, with, with, with a fight mentality in a farm attack is, is you don't actually know whether you have the, the mental sort of um, the mindset to fight or not until you're actually in the fight. Um, a lot of people aren't prepared to fight. Um, most people will do the best that they can when they actually, when it actually dawns on them that I might die here. But to, to be in a farm attack where you're faced with multiple attackers, you have to be, you have to be almost the aggressor. You have to be proactive. Um, you're not cowering under your bed waiting for them to come to you, drag you out and then realizing, oh shit, I better start fighting now. Paul, that's it. we've got a question from a lot of guys in the in the comments asking: Are there anything you know, city folk or or the rest of society can do at all regarding preventing combating farm attacks? Is there anything that they can do? Um, oh yeah, most definitely, and you'll love this. Petition your local politician to get me an LMG. Um, <laughs> then, I'm, then I'm sorted. But, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's all about, you know, we're on our own. Um, nobody's coming to save us. The police are too far away. Even if you have a farm watch, um, depending on how isolated you are, best scenario, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, an hour before somebody gets to you, you're on your own. And, and we're hamstringed because we have, we have, gun laws in this country where if you apply today or you start the process today, you might have it in two years' time, if you're lucky. 
uh, I know people have been waiting four or five years' time. And then the, the, the guns that that are available to your average farmer are no match for those that the farmer attacker has. Um, but it, it it's a political thing. Um, the cards are being stacked against us, not just us farmers, all of us. Um, our, our ability to sort of defend ourselves and, and to fight back is being tampered and, and sort of stolen day by day. I was just trying to read that comment quickly. Oh, sorry, I'll put, I'll, I'll put it back <laughs> up there, but um, I, I saw it blocked your entire face. I was like, um, yeah, you, you unfortunately do get um, the fuckwits who aren't doing our causes any favors, um, but we'll deal with those in 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 time. Yeah, on both sides. The reality of the is, yeah. no. Um, a lot of black farmers are victims of farm attacks. Yeah. Um, Good point. It 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 it's not just a case of. Um, only white farmers are targeted and not black farmers. I mean, there's two weeks ago, a horrific story of an Indian farming couple. A pregnant yeah. wife had a bracelet in front of her child for absolutely no reason. They, it wasn't as if she was resisting. The, the attackers had won the fight. Um, there, was, there was zero reason for that kind of brutality to happen, and yet it did. And, yeah. and it happens and in almost every farm attack and here's the funny thing about that type of marxist rhetoric is when you talk about shoot the boar kill the farmer whatever all of a sudden there are a lot of muslim and a lot of black boers that fit the profile of the victim and then the entire thing becomes really bloody messy because what are you achieving now? And ultimately, this is what they're achieving. The Marxist goal here, and it's becoming clearer and clearer to me every day, is it's not just based on race. If you own property, if you are productive, if you own land, if you do anything like that, you are the natural enemy of any form of centralized state control. And rhetoric is slippery because they can adapt it any way they want on the fly to change who the victim is. Stalin was great at doing that. So was Lenin. Mao was fantastic at it. Um, and this is a point of, it really is everybody on a farm. And if we can get you a light machine gun, hell yes. <laughs> um, yeah, most definitely. But it, it applies to you as well, or to Rowan in, in, yeah. in his townhouse in George. Um, we're all potential targets at the end of the day. Um, yeah. And sooner or later, with the way the economy is going, people are going to be coming to take your shit because they don't have anything. Um, and so and, it. And, and I often say, you know, go without food. Like, I mean, really go without food. Not, not like, oh, I'm on a diet. Don't eat for a week and then come back and say what you will be prepared to do to your neighbor to get his stuff in his fridge. Um, we all need LMG soon. And you know what? Another thing which I think sometimes gets forgotten in, in, the, in the discussion is, you know, a lot of times the victims of farm attacks is not only the farmer and the family, it's the farm workers themselves. I mean, the, of how many times are they victimized, um, attacked, threatened, you know, or or just sometimes killed in the process just for being there. And, and and I think it's important to say that, you know, it's not always just the, you know, the the farm owners themselves that's the victims. It's often than not those that rely on him that get shared over the same code. I'm no, I was right. Myself. I thought. <laughs> <laughs> no, you go. You've just had your cigarette. Hoy. Yeah, you've got to enjoy these things. Uh, they're very rare and hard to come by. <laughs> <laughs> I might be trading my Jack Daniels for some soon. Uh, I'll get cigarettes to trade you for the Jack. How's that? Oh, I've 
got plenty of bottles of Jack. Um, <laughs> because, yeah, shock horror, I don't drink. Um, even though I live surrounded by wine farms. Um, and, and one of the reasons that being a farmer, um, it, it's just a conscious decision I made that I need to be situational aware all the time. Um, and having a bra on a Friday night, if I do that every Friday night, um, people will know. The Burki is Friday night, he's, he's to bed early and he's not waking up. Um, I mean, I think the last time my wife and I slept through a night is about 20 years ago. Um, we take shifts getting up. Um, I take the sort of the danger hour where most attacks happen between 12 and 2. Um, because that, that if, if you want to live on a farm, that is how you live, have to live. You can't stick your head in the sand. You're not living in La La Land. There are no pink unicorns frying around. Um, that's the life you've chosen, and, and that's how you live. And I think that's a, that's a solid bombshell. Um, guys, and my connection is beginning to tank solidly. So before the stream drops, um, any closing thoughts? And then we'll just talk offline after the stream ends about sorting your, um, your gun out for you. Uh, Paul, but I'll start, I'll start with you and then Rowan and then I'll just try to finish us off. Yeah, um, saving farmers, stopping farm attacks, it, it's, it, it's more of a political thing more than anything else. Um, I've seen lots of people volunteer and suggest that um, people from the city without jobs come and help on the farms to save us. Um, look, most of us are pretty capable of, of, of saving ourselves. Um, but we've just gone through this whole narrative of gender-based violence, which is a fantastic narrative to have. Um, but at the same time, there's no admission of what's happening in the farmlands. Um, in fact, there's a complete and absolute denial of it. And the only solution is a political one if you want to stop farm attacks. Um, and, and that's to get politicians to acknowledge they actually exist. I see some political parties jumped on the bandwagon and started bizarre sort of campaigns to save the farmers by monitoring court cases and writing letters. That's awesome. Um, I'll be sure to get one of those letters and wave it in the farm attacker's face next time they come to my farm and say, wait, look, here's a bloody letter. Um, yeah, um, <laughs> that's it for me. Well, that's a, <laughs> that's a good point, Rowan. Fatum, I've seen you, Um, no, 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 I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm laughing with you guys. No, um, I, th I think if, 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 if this message gets out to just one farmer that might be listening, you know, yeah. be honest with yourself. There's nothing wrong with asking for help. There's nothing wrong with realizing, yes, like, I'm not as fit or as young as I was once 20, 30 years ago. There's, there's no me. shame. <laughs> and, <laughs> there's, there's no shame in admitting that you need training or you need guidance or you need assistance. There's, there's no reason for your pride to get you killed. It's stupid. You're not going to impress anybody you're not going to die a martyr. It's you'll die an idiot. Sorry, there's, there I said it. Oh, then all the help in the world is available out there. And, and you don't, don't come and ask me. I'm not an expert. But there's so many trainers, subject matter experts, security guys, forums, Facebook pages, YouTube channels. There's, there's all the info in the world. Just be honest with yourself and, and realize that I need, sometimes you need help and and sometimes you screw up and and some it, it, and then realize that it starts and ends with you I, I think I made the point this week on on, on, on Paratus Kid and I said that you know what you're the cake the rest is all just icing the rest is just decoration you're the heart of the matter you as the individual and just there's nothing there's no shame I don't know why maybe it's a it's a 
a white Afrikaans thing. I don't know, but we hate asking for help. Um, <laughs> there's no shame in saying, hold on, I need to speak to an expert. I need to, maybe I need to go on a shooting course, or maybe I need to get get guys to assist me, or, or whatever, but be honest with yourself. I have not met one instructor, instructor or subject matter expert in, in, in my time that was not willing to share information. So there's really no excuse to be ignorant anymore. Um, it's available and then a lot of times it's free. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I'm gonna f jump off what you said. I'm just gonna tell Brian um, that I think there are some initiatives that, that is trying to change perceptions. I'm not aware of all of them, but I will ask around, I'll find out and uh, I'll revert with an answer. Um, I sound like a bloody parliamentarian now. Um, <laughs> so although I, although I want to say this applies as much to farmers as it applies to people in the city, if you are getting your ass kicked, and I'm paraphrasing Clint Smith here badly, if you're busy getting your ass kicked in a parking lot or next to a farm gate in the felt, either at 3 a.m. or whatever time this happens, that is not the time to be acquiring new skills. You need to already have a bit of a fucking idea what you're going to do to get out of that situation. Preferably, you need to have a skill set that prevents you from getting into it. But that's a whole nother discussion. And on, on that bombshell, Paul, thanks for joining us. We're going to talk sure. offline now um, to try and sort out your, your gun licensing issue. And uh, Ron, thanks for thanks for for for, for uh, being my teammate. Well, we, we're all on the same side anyway. But thanks for being on the show. And um, to the audience, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for interacting. Thanks for asking questions. And we'll probably follow this up with another discussion, a bit more in depth, and a couple of other things. So, uh, yeah, this is not uh, this is not the last chat we're going to be having about this. You guys have a wonderful rest of the Monday night. I hope you get lots of booze and cigarettes. Big, big fat middle finger to Cyril and Mama Zuma on your way out. And uh, yeah, we'll chat again tomorrow. Cheers, guys. Have a lucky evening. Thank you, guys. It. Thank you.